On December 4, 1997, a motorist was driving on Highway 88, just south of Lake Tahoe, when he saw a dark object in the snow on the side of the road. He got out of his vehicle and took a closer look, but when he saw it was the frozen body of a young woman, he got back in his car and found somewhere to notify the police. When an Alpine County Sheriff's deputy arrived on the scene, he first assumed that the woman was the victim of a car accident. When he climbed down the embankment to look at the victim, he noted that she was fully clothed with a backpack and a lunch bag. She had her wallet on her and cash inside. The young woman had been reported missing the previous day, but the location of the body was 175 miles or 280 kilometers away. At her autopsy, it became clear that she had not been the victim of a car accident. The first injuries identified by the medical examiner were bruising around her neck that led the doctor to determine the cause of death was mechanical asphyxiation due to ligature strangulation. This is the medical term for when someone is strangled with a device other than someone's hands. As the medical examiner worked his way over the body, he found multiple bruises on both sides of her buttocks. There was further evidence of sexual assault and penetration of the rectum with a foreign object. This young woman had been tortured, raped, and then strangled before her body was dumped off the side of the road. Authorities would normally want to work fast to get someone this evil off of the streets. But this time, they didn't have to worry about more victims because the people responsible for this crime were already behind bars. This is Monsters. James DeVeggio was born on July 27, 1960 in San Francisco, California. His parents separated when he was young and his mother remarried when he was four years old. But he always idolized his father, who would go on to have numerous wives with overlapping girlfriends. James's stepfather worked for Safeway grocery stores and transferred a lot, making the family move around the San Francisco area quite frequently. Even at a young age, James had a deep, raspy voice, which earned him the nickname Froggy. When James was 13 years old, he had briefly dated a girl at school named Cassie Riley. She was also 13, and people say that, like most early teen romances, theirs only lasted a few weeks. On September 24, 1974, Cassie came home from school, borrowed some money from her stepsister, and left to walk down to a local convenience store. When she hadn't come home until well after dinner time, her stepmother tried to report her missing, but the police told her that Cassie hadn't been missing long enough, because you wouldn't want to look for a missing 13-year-old right away or anything. Cassie's body was found the next day near a creek, naked from the waist down. The medical examiner determined that Cassie had been attacked and then drowned in the creek. She was then pulled out of the water and had her jeans pulled down and her underwear ripped off, but he found no evidence of sexual assault. Detectives canvassed the area and got multiple people claiming to have seen Cassie at different times, some of which contradicted the other witnesses. Some of them had seen her with a young boy about her age with shoulder-length blonde hair. Authorities asked Cassie's stepsister which boys she would hang out with, and one of them was James DeVeggio, who also happened to have shoulder-length blonde hair. When they interviewed James, the interview was quick and based off the officer's notes. James told him that they had dated for a couple of weeks about six months prior and that the breakup was mutual. The officer also noted that James's shoe size was 11, which was larger than shoe prints found at the scene. James's stepsister would later recall that his mother had lied and told police officers that James was home that day, but she knew he wasn't. Eventually, an 18-year-old named Marvin Much was arrested and convicted of the crime, though the evidence was circumstantial and people have said the prosecution used questionable tactics. 
The shoe prints at the scene were of a basketball sneaker and Marvin didn't own a single pair of basketball sneakers. The entire conviction was based pretty much on a couple of people saying they thought they saw him in the area. With this conviction being questionable, many people believe that someone else was responsible for Cassie's death, the most popular suspect being James DeVeggio. James's young life was filled with trouble. He once stole a girlfriend's mother's car and drove a bunch of friends to Lake Tahoe. Another time, he got a girl pregnant and his mother had to take her to get an abortion. Eventually, his mother sent him to stay with his father for a while, but the move didn't really straighten him out. He got a job at a fast food restaurant, but was soon fired for stealing. Then he started stealing stuff from his father, and that's when he was kicked out. Back with his mother and stepfamily, his behavior continued to escalate. He called the school administrator a, quote, bald-headed motherfucker, and was kicked out of school. After he got a car, a blue 1957 Thunderbird, he used it to be a getaway driver when his friend robbed a gas station. His friend pulled a gun on the attendant and demanded money. He grabbed the loot and jumped back into the car, but as they sped away, the attendant wrote down the license plate number and they were arrested. James was sent to the Alameda County Boys Detention Camp. When James was released, he tried to stay on the straight and narrow and married a young woman named Annette. The couple had a daughter in 1980, and soon after, James left Annette for a 17-year-old named Danetta, but he was still sleeping with his wife, so they had another daughter together in 1981. Instead of leaving James when Danetta found out about the pregnancy, she let him convince her to marry him. Despite not being divorced from Annette, James married Danetta on May 7, 1982. They lived with James's mother, and Danetta worked two jobs while James was unemployed. On top of that, his mother waited on him hand and foot. She cooked him food and made his bed. Donetta said that it was easy to see why James was the way he was. His mother treated him like God's gift to the world. The other thing that James's mother gave him was the idea of joining the military. His stepfather was an Air Force veteran and James was convinced that joining the army would somehow solve his problems. Since James was the type of person who hated being told what to do, him joining the army was a disaster. He didn't even make it through basic training at Fort Leonard Wood before getting a medical discharge. After that, his mother tried to set him up with a job in Oklahoma and James and Donetta moved out there, but he quit after a few weeks and came right back. On July 18, 1984, James was at a Black Angus restaurant, drinking at the bar. He had hit on a young woman, but she turned down his advances. When she got up to leave, he followed her out to the parking lot and the two disappeared. About an hour later, James and the woman returned in his car and she was in hysterics. She said that James had kidnapped her and forced her to perform oral sex on him. Police were called and they arrested James. He was charged with kidnapping and forced oral copulation. Due to the fact that the woman was so intoxicated at the time, her memory of the events weren't very solid and the prosecutor eventually dropped the case. On July 25, 1985, Janet Stokes had worked a very long day and went out to the bar afterwards to blow off some steam. While there, she met James and his friend John Huffstetler. After drinking and playing pool for a while, she knew she had to get home and said goodbye to the men. She had had too many drinks to drive, but was only a few blocks from her house, so she went outside and made sure her car was locked before turning to walk home. When she did, James and John were outside and James was insisting that he give her a ride home. Being too tired to argue, she accepted and got into James's car. As they drove down the road, they passed her house and began driving out of town. Janet demanded to be let out of the car, but James just told her to shut up. When she continued begging for her release, John pointed a pistol at her and again told her to shut up. Soon enough, James pulled over on a secluded road and told Janet to perform oral sex on him. She said no. While James began hitting her on the head, John reached up from behind and removed her bra. James unzipped his pants and pushed her head into his lap while still beating her on the head. Janet finally gave in and complied with his demands. 
When she was finished, she asked if she could get out to urinate. John said yes, but when she moved to get out of the car, he fired the gun right by her head. James was not happy with John's behavior and told him to knock it off. Then he started the car and pulled back out onto the road. It just so happened that a police patrol car had been driving by at the same moment John fired the weapon, and he pulled them over. James and John were arrested and charged with kidnapping, forced oral copulation, and use of a firearm. James ended up pleading guilty to kidnapping and forced oral copulation, but not to the firearms charges in exchange for a sentence to be determined after a 90-day mental health evaluation by the Vacaville Medical Facility. They deemed that he should receive a one-year sentence and be placed on the sex offender registry. Only four months later, he was in a minimum security jail where he was allowed to be out of the facility during the day. He was released from quote-unquote jail in July of 1986. By the time James was out of jail, Donetta had given birth to James's third daughter, divorced him, changed her name, and moved away. While still living with his mother, he took a diesel mechanics course but never ended up finishing it. He did meet his third wife, a woman named Dita. She already had an eight-year-old daughter, and in an effort to get a fresh start, they all moved to a suburb of Sacramento in 1988. While in Sacramento, Dita gave birth to James's first son. Not long afterward, James was arrested for trying to hire a prostitute who was really an undercover police officer. He was also cited for disorderly conduct for being intoxicated. For this, he was given a $292 fine and released. This was despite him being on the sex offender registry and being on probation. He should have been sentenced to probation violation, but it apparently slipped through the cracks. James decided that he didn't want any more kids, so in 1993 he went to a Planned Parenthood and got a vasectomy. This is the first person I've ever written about who has actually taken action to stop having a bunch of kids. Wow. After that, he bought a purple Harley Davidson and joined a motorcycle gang called the Devil's Horsemen. He started dating a woman who owned a local bar, and it wasn't long before Dita left James. He began living with the bar owner and working at her bar. When that relationship started going downhill, he started working for another bar called Bobby Joe's. It was there that he would meet a woman that would change his life forever. Michelle Machad was born in 1959 in Casablanca, Morocco, and grew up the daughter of a career Air Force officer. Due to her father's position, they moved around a lot. He was very strict and expected his family to live with military order. Michelle's siblings were good and seemed to accept the discipline, but she was rebellious. She didn't want to live with extreme rules, so she dropped out of school when she was 16 years old and ran away from home. They were living near Sacramento at the time, and with no other job prospects, Michelle turned to prostitution to make a living. She worked on the streets for six years before she got a job at a massage parlor as a high-end call girl. She liked the work and enjoyed being the one in charge when she was with a client. For a while, she moved out to Mound House, Nevada and worked at the Kit Kat Ranch. Then she moved up to the Mustang Ranch near Reno. She enjoyed spending her free time relaxing in Lake Tahoe, but the rest of the time she was stuck at the ranch and eventually became homesick and moved back to Sacramento. Over the years, she had two kids with different men and she didn't want to expose them to the life of a sex worker. At 27, she quit her job at the massage parlor. She started going to church, enrolled her kids in Catholic school, and began volunteering at the school as a crossing guard. By all outside appearances, she began living a seemingly normal life as a suburban soccer mom. Behind the scenes, she was making a living by providing sex to two sugar daddies, but during the day, her neighbors just saw her as a single mother raising her kids. After 10 years of living a simple life in suburbia, Michelle began to grow restless. At 37, Michelle started going to bars again with friends and one of the bars she ended up at was Bobby Joe's. Michelle says that she and a friend went to the bar where she saw James working as a bartender. She leaned over to her friend, pointed at James and said, quote, I want that. It wasn't long before James and Michelle were involved in an intense relationship. She told James about her past as a sex worker and he had no judgment about it. 
It was even a little bit of a turn-on. Her lack of sexual inhibitions led to James being able to carry out his fantasies with Michelle. Rough sex, threesomes, sex toys, nothing was off limits. The only problem was that the increase in wild sex meant that James wasn't able to get an erection unless he had two women. He and Michelle would regularly coax a young drunk woman back to their place to engage in a threesome. When James moved into Michelle's house, he brought with him booze, loud motorcycles, and meth. Michelle became more and more reliant on the drug, which only decreased her mental stability. It also began to affect her looks, which drove away her sugar daddies. At the same time, James became fascinated with serial killers. He was interested in all of the big serial killers like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy, but he became obsessed with Gerald and Charlene Gallego. They were a couple who kidnapped, raped, and killed at least 10 young women, mostly teenagers, in Sacramento between 1978 and 1980. James was needing more and more to get excited, and he believed that this could be the answer. In September of 1997, Michelle approached one of her daughter's friends, 13-year-old Nancy Baker, and asked her if she wanted to go shopping with her. Nancy agreed, but instead of shopping, Michelle took her back to her house where James was waiting. They all snorted meth, and after they were high, Michelle pulled Nancy into the bathroom and told her to take her clothes off. When Nancy objected, Michelle pulled a gun and told her she had to. When Nancy refused to participate in any sexual activity with Michelle, she pulled her out of the bathroom. She and James pushed her into the bedroom where James raped her while Michelle pleasured herself. When he was done, Michelle took Nancy back into the bathroom and told her she would kill her if she ever told anyone. Nancy knew Michelle and James well enough to believe they were serious, so she kept the attack to herself, at least for now. Without her sugar daddies to pay the bills, Michelle was evicted from her house. James just crawled back to an ex-girlfriend and stayed there while Michelle slept in her minivan or at her sister's house. In need of cash, James believed it would be a good idea to steal $1,500 from the biker gang. Knowing that he had been broke and then was suddenly spending money, it wasn't difficult for them to find out who ripped them off. When they came after him, he went into hiding, so they took his Harley and called it even. Losing her house made Michelle angry at the world, and in her drug-fueled haze, she was much more receptive to James's suggestions that they find a girl to kidnap and rape. James turned her green Dodge minivan into a mobile torture chamber. They drove out to Reno because the Gallegos had some victims there and James wanted to be just like them. They checked into a room at the Circus Circus. Michelle still had one of her sugar daddy's credit cards and they maxed it out over the next few days with gambling, room service, and pay-per-view movies. James was a gambling addict, but he never won any money, so he quickly depleted their resources. They borrowed $20 from an old friend of Michelle's and headed out of town. Before they left Reno, though, they trolled the city to find a victim for their torture van. On September 29, 1997, they saw 20-year-old Juanita Rodriguez walking home. She was supposed to get a ride from her boyfriend, but he had a flat tire. James instructed Michelle to drive up next to the girl and as soon as he was close enough, he threw the side door open and pulled the young woman into the van. With their victim in the back of the van, Michelle began driving west and James spent hours sexually assaulting Juanita. When James was finished, they pulled over at Clipper Gap, about 40 miles or 65 kilometers northeast of Sacramento, and let Juanita out of the van. They threatened to kill her if she told anyone and left her in the middle of nowhere. Michelle dropped James off at Dita's house, she was still in fact his wife, and then she slept in her van. The next day, they shaved James's head and Michelle tucked her hair up into a baseball cap. They added a silver stripe across the minivan in an effort to change its appearance. James also decided that he was going to need more room in the back of the van, so he pulled out the rear seats and added ropes and a come-along so he could tie up his victims and stretch them like a medieval torture device. Juanita made it to a hospital where she was interviewed by the police. 
She gave them a description of the van and worked with a composite artist to make a sketch of James. She said she hadn't gotten a good look at the woman driving. Authorities searched for the van and the suspects, but the case went cold. In October, James and Michelle were ready for another victim, but instead of hunting for someone to kidnap, they decided to use what was right in front of them. They invited her daughter to join them on a trip to Klamath Falls, Oregon, where they raped her in a motel room. At the beginning of November, James and Michelle headed back to the Pleasanton area near San Francisco to continue hunting victims in James's old stomping grounds. They soon met a young woman named Patty Wilson who worked at a video arcade. They managed to get her into their van where she was raped. The couple threatened to kill her if she told anyone before letting her go. Then they headed east to Lake Tahoe. While James and Michelle were laying low, Michelle's daughter and Nancy finally talked to the police about what had happened to both of them. When police showed a mugshot of James to Juanita Rodriguez, she immediately picked him out of the photo array and said, quote, that's him. Despite an intense search for the pair, authorities in the Sacramento area had no luck finding them. When James and Michelle returned to the Bay Area, they spent the Thanksgiving holiday with his first wife, Annette. James's daughter had just turned 16 and was going to get her driver's license, so James invited her to stay at his and Michelle's motel, which was close to the DMV. When they got to the motel, James started asking his daughter a bunch of strange questions, if she had ever wanted to torture people, and if she would help hide him if he ever killed somebody. After the uncomfortable interaction, James took a shower and when he was finished, he forced his daughter onto the bed where he performed oral sex on her while Michelle gave him a blowjob. Afterward, he went out to get beverages and while he was gone, Michelle asked if she wanted to come along with them to kill someone the next day. The girl understandably said no. On December 1st, James and Michelle went to a Kmart and bought two curling irons. Then they went to an adult toy shop and purchased a ball gag, handcuffs, and an audio tape titled Submissive Young Girls. The next day, 22-year-old Vanessa Sampson was walking to work in the morning when she noticed a green minivan driving near her. Suddenly, the van pulled up beside her and James jumped out and grabbed her. In an instant, she was gagged and tied up as Michelle pulled the van onto the highway. Michelle drove around, running errands like nothing was amiss. She stopped for gas and then stopped at a check-cashing place to cash her $538 welfare check. While this was happening, James spent hours raping and torturing Vanessa. He used the curling irons to penetrate her as she was tied tight in the back of the van. Michelle had a court date in Lake Tahoe for passing bad checks a few months prior, so she headed east. It's crazy to think that someone has a kidnapped woman in her van who's being sexually assaulted and tortured by her boyfriend, but she wants to make sure she makes it to her court date for another, lesser crime. People are strange, especially criminals. When they arrived at the Sundowner Motel, James registered for a room and they managed to get their captive inside without being seen. In the room, both James and Michelle continued to sexually assault Vanessa. They also used both curling irons, both of which were placed inside her rectum at some point. At the end of the day, when the thrill had died down for the two sick individuals, they loaded Vanessa back into the van and drove out of town. On the outskirts of Lake Tahoe, Michelle stopped the van and she and James used a rope to strangle Vanessa. They each pulled on one side of the rope so they could experience the kill together. They drove a little farther out of town and dumped the young woman's body into a ravine. Then they drove back to Lake Tahoe. Instead of fleeing the area, they cleaned up at the Sundowner Motel and went over to the Lakeside Inn, a place they frequented, and got a room there. Police in the Sacramento area knew all about James DeVeggio and Michelle Michaud. They had connected them to three kidnapping and rapes, and Vanessa's disappearance had been reported after she didn't show up for work. Authorities started a massive search for the young woman, but they wouldn't find her in the area where she was abducted. Eventually, authorities got a tip that James and Michelle liked to spend time in Lake Tahoe, specifically at the Lakeside Inn. 
One detective called an FBI agent at a field office in Lake Tahoe and asked if he'd go over to the hotel and see if a green Dodge minivan was in the parking lot. A little while later, the agent called back with news that the van was in fact in the parking lot. When authorities approached room 133 at the Lakeside Inn on the evening of December 3, 1997, one of them knocked on the door and said, quote, Mrs. DeVeggio, your husband is in the casino and he's very ill. With her guard down, she opened the door and was immediately surrounded by federal agents. They had only guessed that James would be in the casino, and they were correct. They found him at a slot machine with a handful of coins, gambling unsuccessfully as usual. He was placed under arrest and marched out of the casino. James didn't say anything. He refused to talk to authorities. Michelle answered some questions, but they were just a means of tap dancing her way around her guilt. Their hotel room was searched and authorities found marijuana, meth, a scale, and a 25 caliber pistol. When the van was searched, authorities found sleeping bags, ropes, a ball gag, the tape titled Submissive Young Girls, duct tape, drugs, and a 38 caliber pistol. They also found a rosary, which Juanita immediately recognized as having been hanging from the rearview mirror of the van. She stared at it the entire time she was being assaulted by James. Forensic technicians found hairs, fibers, blood, and fingerprints in the van. Fibers and hairs matched those of Juanita Rodriguez, and authorities knew that they were on their way to convicting both James and Michelle for kidnap and rape. It wasn't until the next day that they realized that James and Michelle were even more evil than they originally thought. When Vanessa Sampson's body was found, investigators took her fingerprints during the autopsy, and they came back as a match to fingerprints that were found inside the van. While Michelle was sitting in jail, she got the shock of her life when news of Vanessa's murder came on the TV, soon followed by a picture of her and James. They thought that Vanessa's body would either be covered by snow or eaten by animals. They didn't realize that her body was visible from the road, and her remains would be discovered only two days after they dumped her body. Michelle was ready to fight when she was charged with just a few kidnappings and rapes, but with a murder charge pending against her, she started trying to distance herself from James and get herself in a better position. Michelle went to the investigators and told them that she had information about Vanessa Sampson. She tried to play it off that she didn't have any involvement in her murder. She also told them about some of the other rape victims, including her own daughter, and she claimed she wasn't involved in those crimes either. A few days later, she was interviewed again, and this time she admitted that James had given her one end of the rope and made her pull on it with him. Her goal was to give them all the details they needed in order to hang James, hoping that she would come out at the other end with a lighter sentence. She underestimated the jury, though. While Michelle was singing to the investigators, authorities from all over were looking into the couple for numerous other crimes. The biggest was the disappearance of J.C. Dugard, who had been abducted in front of her stepfather in 1991. He saw a woman snatch J.C. and drive off with her, and the composite sketch of the woman he saw looked a lot like Michelle. Of course, neither she nor James were involved in that kidnapping. J.C. was found in 2009 and had been taken by Philip and Nancy Garrido. Another detective was looking into the murder of 14-year-old Kelly Poppleton, whose body was also discovered by a passing motorist on the side of the road in 1983. She was found in an area close to where James worked at the time. Authorities tried to connect James to the disappearance of multiple young girls, but there was no evidence to prove anything. Kelly Poppleton's remains had been cremated, so they weren't able to go back and try to find DNA. James and Michelle were tried in Reno for the kidnap and rape of Juanita Rodriguez. The trials were severed, so James and Michelle would have separate trials, and Michelle's was scheduled first. Her lawyer tried to get her statements to the FBI thrown out because the agent lied when he knocked on the door, but the judge denied the request. Eventually, Michelle gave in and pleaded guilty to kidnapping and the prosecutor dropped the charge of conspiracy. Then, Michelle agreed to testify against James at his trial. At James's trial, the prosecution presented both Juanita's testimony, Michelle's testimony, and evidence that Juanita had been inside Michelle's van. 
They also explained that the semen they recovered from Juanita had no sperm in it, which meant they weren't able to get DNA at the time, but it did match the fact that James had had a vasectomy. The defense tried to prove that Juanita had been attacked by a different person by asking her why she told the police that her attacker had a high-pitched voice. Everybody knew that James had a low, raspy voice, hence the nickname Froggy. In an embarrassing turn for the defense, English was not Juanita's first language and it turned out that her statement had been mistranslated and she actually said he had a strong voice and imitated it to the officers making a low, raspy sound. When she was questioned by the police, she had in fact perfectly described James and now the jury was well aware of that. On May 19, 1999, James DeVeggio was found guilty of kidnapping and raping Juanita Rodriguez. He was sentenced to 24 years in prison. It was after James's trial that Michelle had her sentencing hearing where the judge sentenced her to 12 years and 8 months in prison. Neither of these sentences would matter though because both of them were sent to California to stand trial for the murder of Vanessa Sampson. The district attorney announced that he would be seeking the death penalty for both James and Michelle. There was a mountain of evidence against James and Michelle. A roofer had come forward explaining that he was on a roof near where Vanessa was abducted and heard a short scream. When he looked down at the road, he saw the green minivan pull away with a woman who matched Michelle's description at the wheel. He shrugged it off as a kid yelling and went back to work but after reading about the case, he realized that he saw the abduction happen. Forensic technicians found Vanessa's fecal matter and blood on both hair curlers and both James and Michelle's fingerprints were on the handles. They also found both Vanessa and James's saliva on the ball gag. They collected semen from the body that had no sperm in it. They had the testimony of Michelle's daughter and her friend Nancy, who not only testified about the rapes, but they explained that it was Michelle who had brought them to James. Michelle was trying to play that she was forced into participating, but those testimonies said otherwise. The prosecutor also presented the testimony of James's own daughter, who he had also sexually assaulted with the participation of Michelle. On May 1st, 2002, James DeVeggio and Michelle Michaud were found guilty of first-degree murder with special circumstances. This meant that the jury had to now decide whether or not the two murderers would die. Just a few weeks later, the jury deliberated and decided that yes, they should both be put to death. James has continued to claim that he did not murder Vanessa. He says that Michelle was the one who killed her, but nobody believes his bullshit. He and Michelle were both evil, and when they got together, they fed off of each other's evil. They raped their own daughters, and when that wasn't enough excitement to get them off, they tortured and killed a young woman. They got pleasure out of inflicting pain on someone else. The only thing on this planet that can do that is a monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.